And welcome, everybody. Thank you for tuning in today. You're listening to WRUU LP Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings Community Radio with Global Soul. And thank you for tuning in today. I'm Adam Messer. I'm your host here on the Adam Messer Show. And I have my special guests today. We have Lisa and Donnell from the House of Stitched magazine. So I'm pretty excited to have both of you here. And Donnell, I, I'm sorry, is it Party Whiting? Yes. Okay. And Lisa Vasquez. So I, I just I just want to make sure I wasn't saying that wrong. But um, yeah, we're going to be talking this uh, next two hours, y'all. You might remember a couple weeks ago I had Lisa... Uh, on the show and we were talking about the house of stitch magazine and Danelle is with us uh today so we'll uh we're gonna rock and roll with that sebastian um do you want to play some live music for us sebastian's here in the studio today pretty excited about it sebastian messer is my son uh, for those of you who are just now tuning in and he is an awesome musician but i'm his dad but uh <clears throat> i'm always always gonna say that but i know a lot of people have said that they really like his music so pretty proud of him so take it away bass Thank you, Bass. That was awesome. So, Lisa and Donnell, were you able to hear? I yeah. was. Mm-hmm. Cool. A funny story, story, real quick. My son's name is also Sebastian. Oh, neat. And he also plays the guitar. That's <laughs> so cool. That's so in cool. His Very cool. Yeah. Uh, what Your, your birthday is next weekend, at Bass? Yep, yeah, next Friday. You're going to be 19. You've been How playing old? for like six years? Yes. Oh, my son's 10 years older than you. Oh, awesome. How old was he when he started playing? Uh, high school. So 12, 13, 14. Yeah, Sebastian was like 13 when he started playing. So that's, that's pretty cool. Funny. Like, you know that one, um, what was it? Uh, Hen- Henley? Don Henley? Um, no, who was the guy that first real six string at the five and dime? The, I think it's Bruce Springsteen. No, that wasn't Bruce Springsteen. It was somebody else. There's this one song where, like he says, I uh, got my first real six string at the five and dime. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Kind of reminds me of, like how you got your first uh, electric guitar at the uh, at the pawn shop. You got the electric guitar and the amp, and yeah, he was he was wanting to get um he was wanting to get a guitar, and we went we used to go cat around and we went into the pawn shop um and they sell like a lot of electrical equipment, music equipment stereo equipment um they sell video games and electronics and stuff like that they don't sell any guns or phones and stuff like that they sell more like like collectible type stuff but it's a pawn shop and uh they had what was it uh it was a uh washburn lion a washburn lion and uh stratocaster knockoff yeah yeah but uh you stuck with it and you've been playing for six years now it's pretty awesome so i think it's pretty cool especially since you're only 19 yeah so, but, uh, yeah, you're going to be playing a couple of times throughout the hour, next hour too. It'd be cool. So <laughs> I'm excited about it. It's his birthday next weekend and I'm, we're going to be here on the studio, in the studio, um, talking about some new stuff coming out and I'm excited to have, uh, you two ladies here because we're going to be talking about the house of stitched. You guys have some new stuff coming out, um, you have the new issue just came out, and then you have uh, the Halloween special ones coming out, right? Yes. So, um, everybody kind of like a little background here. Uh, met Lisa through the, basically through, I, I saw you on TikTok, and I'd seen the um, the magazine uh, through the Horrors Writers Association Horror Writers Association group, 
and uh, I'm friends with Daker Stoker. And I was like, oh, look at that. And Chris McCauley uh, is another guy uh, that I know. And I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. We have like a little, little small circle, you know, it's a writing community, uh, especially horrors. You know, it's kind of a tight little knit group. And uh, I thought it'd be cool if you if you come on the show. And I really enjoyed it. And then um, I thought it'd be really neat if we could, you know, do another one. And you're like, hey, let's get to know one here, too. And I was like, oh, well, that sounds good. So I'm, I'm excited to be here. Lisa, are you there too? I think we might've lost Lisa. Oh, did we lose her? Yeah. Cause she's okay. not on the call. Um, nope. well let's do this. I'm oh. everybody. We're gonna have to, we're gonna have to do this. Bass, I need you to take over for a second here. Let me, uh, let me yeah, check. her call. She, she messaged her call dropped. That's so weird. It's still saying this on there, but, uh, let me see if I can add the call back. Right. I'm turn it on. Hey, Donnell, it's Adam. Hey, I'm going to try to get Lisa on the line. Hold on a second. Here. Okay. with stitched smile poetry. Hey, hold on a second. Then. Oh, it's going to our voicemail. Okay. I'm not really sure what's up. Hold on a second. Okay. Gotta love technology. <laughs> Hello. Hey, uh, Lisa, it's Adam again. Um, hold on one second here. I didn't. I don't know what happened there. Uh, Donnell? Yes. Lisa? Yep. All right. All right. Yeah. So, all right. That's good, Bass. Thank you very much. All right, everybody. We were, we were uh, had a call drop there, and I'm sorry about that. I don't know what happened. That's so weird because uh, I'm sitting there talking about how uh, how I met Lisa uh, because I saw I saw the House of Stitch on TikTok, and I was like, reached out to you, and next thing I know, I was like, you there, Lisa? Hello? Hello? Yeah. <laughs> like crickets? Crickets? Chirp, chirp. Chirp, chirp. A woman of few words. <laughs> I know, but then that's the beauty of uh, that's the beauty of uh, live radio, um, you know, because that I feel like I I know it sounds really crazy, but you know, as much as we like to have produced and you know perfect stuff, I think sometimes the quirkiness of like technology and human error can be you know can add flavor to it too, because then you're like, well, I know it's not it's not recorded, <laughs> so yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I'm excited to have both y'all on the show today. Um, we're going to have to let people know, like, hey, if you want to get started on the meat and potatoes of the show, you got to go, like, to minute 309. <laughs> 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 but, uh, you know, that's the whole thing about, I think, especially that's a great example of independent media production, right? Like, whatever, yeah. like, oh, my gosh. Yesterday I was, I was messaging Lisa. Um, she had messaged me about... Uh, promo post and we were uh, talking about that a little bit and I was oh my gosh I was like into yesterday I was into like hour number four for working on a book formatting mm. and I spent another two hours on a different book formatting but I spent the first book I spent like eight hours formatting and I, I'm not going to say that I am like the most adept person with Word and Excel and all that um, but it was using word, but I'm, you know, I'm a high level user when it comes to that kind of stuff. And, um, it was, it took me like eight hours because 
the we're we're relaunching a book series. So one of the books is, has been previously published. It's it's free game from the other publisher. It's gone off the other publisher's contract or whatever. But I'm going to be publishing a brand new book number two for this series. So we're relaunching the book number one, and, and book number two is like brand new, never been read before. And so the author had a PDF copy, but did not have a Word copy. And so mm-hmm. and so when they converted it from PDF to Word, it had like a lot of wonky stuff. And I was like, uh, and even, you know, doing like find and replace and all that stuff I had to go through. And, you know, it's like 300 pages of, you know, Word document. And you, <laughs> after a little while, your brain's like, <laughs> it got to go much. So the lesson, the lesson to all listeners is if you write a book and you send it in to somebody for submission you save your original copy <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah and this save uh, it. <laughs> yeah unfortunately uh, the every author version did. as you go yeah yeah and something that for me uh you know as an independent publisher uh what i i'm going to do and i started to think about this yesterday but what i'm going to do is i have a formatted version because we're using the five by eight size for the paperbacks mm-hmm and I have a formatted version so that when they're writing their first draft, it can already be you know, pre-formatted without them, you know, doing like, you know, because I, I, I don't really have a style guide per se because I don't I don't have any open submissions, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'm going to give each one of the authors I'm working with this template and say, hey, use this for your future works. That way it's pre-formatted. We can go back and touch it up or whatever, but man i was like <laughs> so yeah you know with uh with independent production of stuff i think uh that's one of the cool things and i remember lisa when we were when you were on a couple weeks ago you were talking about um you know with the magazine the house of stitch magazine it's been like an evolution of you know just upgrading as you learn new stuff and change new stuff and you know so that's pretty cool and you know and danelle you being here today um yeah. so i'd like to i kind of like to dive into that you know like talking about that and <laughs> you know some of the uh interviews and stuff like that that you've done and you know that way we can kind of share that with other people too so okay but uh yeah so um tell me about the new tell me about the new magazine coming up well the new one yeah i'll let danelle let danelle talk talk about that okay so wait which new one though because we have two coming up one in october and then we have one at the end of the year uh, mid-December to late December. Uh, so we have our Halloween 2021 and our winter 2022. So which one would you like to know about? I can tell you about both. Well, why don't we talk about the one that's coming up more immediately? Okay, the one in October is going to focus more on our staff. Uh, we have a fabulous, fabulous staff, and they they just bust tail to, to get those words out and make them the best that they can. They help where they step up and help wherever they can. Um, so we're going to highlight them. We're going to take the spotlight off of our celebrated creatives that we've been interviewing and stick it on our staff and let them shine for a change. That's we cool because most of your staff are reviewer. authors as well, right? We have one that does book reviews, and that's uh, Lisa Lee. And she's phenomenal. She has her own web, her own blog about reviews. And we have Tom Clark, an editor. Yeah, she is an editor. Yes, yeah. she does. She does double duty. She she edits. Uh, we have Tommy Clark, who is an author himself. He's also a podcaster with his own podcast, Necrocasticon. Um, and then we have Larissa Bennett. She is uh, she's a editor. She's an executive assistant, and she's a poet. And oh, then we nice. have uh, Aurelio Lopez, uh, Aurelio Rico Lopez the Third. We just call him Doc Thirty. He mm-hmm. is from the Philippines, and he is a doctor. He's a OBGYN, but he's a poet, and he writes novella-length stories with a bit of a, with a bit of humor in them. You know, he's kind of that dark humor that you might find, like, uh, for example, in the movie Shaun of the Dead. You know, it's zombies, but there's that those humorous tone to it. He writes in that style, and uh, don't don't remind me. Uh, <laughs> We have an artist, I know Tara my, Bennett, who helps me out a lot. That's cool. I know my friend Candace Nola just um, joined y'all, too. She did. And we love her already. She's already family. Yeah, she's she's really great. I like her a lot. 
and uh, very very supportive and encouraging. And I think she also does editing as well. She's a writer, but she's also an editor yes. and a book reviewer. So. Mm-hmm. And we have, we have Jay. Jay. Oh, yes. Jay, Jay and Jessica. Both phenomenal artists in their own right. And they are with a, with a twist of lovely sarcastic humor that we love so much in our Stitch family. Mm-hmm. So they fit right in. And everybody, uh, you're tuning in today to the Adam Messer Show here on WRUULP Savannah, Georgia. 107.5 FM, WRU.org. We are Savannah Soundings Community Radio with Global Soul. And on this show, um, I like to talk about WRU every once in a while. Um, as a station, it's a community radio station. We're all volunteers. I just uh, celebrated my third year doing the radio show here in Savannah. And I talk with authors, artists, and entertainers. Our, sh- our station and this show could not happen without you, the listener. So if you like the show or if you like the programming that you hear on WRUU and you want to help support and keep us commercial free radio go to WRUU.org and consider making a donation there's a little donation button right up there and even a dollar can help out so that's my uh, my plug for WRUU I like uh, I like being on the radio show uh, I love doing this I get to talk with uh, you know people like you and uh, talk about cool stuff like House of Stitch magazine, and so that's one of the things I really enjoy doing um, with this radio show. And you know, it's crazy because when I was a kid, y'all, I um, I used to listen to talk radio up in Cincinnati on Seven Hundred WLW, and I never thought of, like you know I could be on the radio. It wasn't that really a, a dream of mine or a goal of mine, but I always liked talk radio. And um, how I got involved with the station, and I, I just hit my seventh year of writing for the newspaper, um, Savannah Morning News, as a freelance journalist. But how I got involved with the station was uh, they were doing this fundraiser called Tunes and Brews. And so I was assigned an article to write about it and interviewed, um, and I interviewed uh, Dr. Dave Lake, who's our station manager. And one of the things that uh, one of the items that he talked about at the very end was that, you know, they were looking for program hosts with show ideas. And I was like, hmm, you know, at that point, I'd been writing for the newspaper for like four years and been doing interviews and stuff like that. And uh, I was like, well, what, what if I did the same kind of format where I do the interviewing like creative people and I just do that on the radio? You know, but it's just do like a casual conversation style. And so that's how that happened. And that's one of the reasons why I like your magazine so much, because I I bought the most recent issue with um, Daker, Stoker and all. And I was looking through it and I've been reading. It. I haven't read it cover to cover, but I've been looking through it. And I think that is so important to um, to share with people you know, these different interviews and talking about the process and talking about, you know, like how to, how to overcome, you know, obstacles, how to, you know, like the best practices or whatever. And I mean, there's a, there's a plethora of stuff out there on the internet. You can find just about anything you want to find out about anything online, but it's really nice when, you know, like with your magazine house of stitch, you have this dark fiction slash nonfiction genre that you, you cover and that you go over and you talk with people who are writers or filmmakers or, you know, um, actors, you know, you, you cover that gamut, you know, and that's one of the things I like about the one with my radio show. Cause I do the same kind of thing with my radio show. And I was like, Oh, this would be a cool little, you know, cool little thing to do. Like talk about your magazine. And since, you know, what's kind of a perfect fit of what I do too. So I'm excited about having y'all here. And I really like what you've been doing with the magazine. I think it's pretty cool. Thank you. We like it too. <laughs> <laughs> I think what what's important is that we fill a gap where, um, like you said, you can find everything on the internet, but is it personal? And who do you, who are these people that are writing the articles? You know, um, a lot of them are are um, clickbaits or you know funnel gates or whatever to get your email, and it's not telling you anything that's going to help you. When we interview people who are you know who we look up to as the creators. 
um, for our colleagues, for our you know, peers, then you're getting sound advice from them that has worked for them. And then, of course, you're getting, well, make sure you avoid this. And here's a funny story about that. And so you're getting this real life um, view of what it's really like to be in industry. It's not all the glam. It's not always, you know, fun and games. There's a lot of um, sacrifice. There's a lot of blood, sweat, and lots of tears. But it can be done. And here's how I did it. And then you can go from there and say, well, this is how he did it. And this is how this person did it and take from it what you need. But the, it tells us that there's not just one way. There's not a cookie cutter, you know, way to do it. And that's what we like is telling their story. Yeah. I, I've had Dacre Stoker on um, every year since I started doing the show. And I met him here in Savannah. So like with you all doing the interview, like he's the feature, one of the feature articles for your, your newest magazine. And I, I just thought it was so cool because I met him here in Savannah at the, the book festival. My friend Ryan Dunn was like, hey, Dacre Stoker's coming to town. This is, you know, uh, Bram Stoker's great grandnephew. And I, I was like, oh, cool. And that's right when they had released Dracul. Mm-hmm. And uh, with him and uh, uh, Barker, I forget his name, I think like J, J.D. Barker. J.D. Something? Yeah, mm-hmm. JD Barker. Yeah, JD Barker, and uh, but Daker was here, and the, the funny thing was is they had this. You know, he did a presentation. He's got this awesome like historical presentation. You know, talking about like Bram Stoker and, and his works and things like that. And um, they had the presentation, but the presentation ran short because they had a fire alarm go off. And, oh no! Yeah, yeah, no. yeah, and it was. But his presentation was so, even the condensed version of it, it was so informative. It was so uh, well put together. I met Dacre at the book signing afterwards. I was like, oh, my gosh. So I read Dracul after, and uh, Ryan was friends with him, and I, I reached out to Dacre on Facebook. It's like three years ago. I reached out to him and said, hey, you know, I'm an author myself, and I also have this radio show. I would love it if you would come on. And that is, that is so true. Like when you're, you know, when you're sharing and you're talking about like, like these things that, you know, people maybe you could find access to it. Right. But it's not, maybe not like in a tidy little you know package or whatever, but I think it's so mm-hmm. cool when you have authors like him or, you know, like Jonathan Mayberry, you know, he's been on my show. He's, he's one of the people that you've interviewed and mm-hmm. you have people like that who, they and I'm certainly not a well-known author or a best-selling author, but when you have people that are like Dacre or like Jonathan, who, you know, they are and they have been best-selling authors, and they come back and they say, "Hey, you know what? I start like like with Jonathan Mayberry. He was like 48 when he published his first novel, and mm-hmm. you know, here it is, like 15 years later, and he's a world-famous author." taking time out of his Sunday afternoon to talk to me on the radio show or taking time out of his, his day to do the interview with you for your magazine. And I, I just love that. That's one of the things I love about like, you know, doing that with the folks and talking with them, even talking with y'all, you know, Lisa, we had such a great time this last time. We're like, Oh yeah, I'd love to have you back on. And you know, and here we are like (laughs) two weeks later, boom, boom, boom. And Danelle, you're here too. And it's, I think that's the part of like, you know, when people talk about building community, I think that is a huge part of it. You know, you, you not just say those, you know, buzzwords that everybody wants to talk about, but you actually live it and you actually do it, you know? Yeah. All right. We love it. So it's, uh, it's a challenge, but we're up for it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not going to ever say I wouldn't love to sell, you know, a ton of books because I do. <laughs> I would love that. <laughs> um, but one of the things like yesterday when I was just like, you know, I, I felt like I had a lobotomy after, you know, spending so much time formatting and it, it was just tedious stuff that had to be done over and over and over again because the, the find and replace didn't work because what it was, is there were, there were spaces and they were like this, uh, the hyphen and spaces and, some of the sentences were broken, you know, like they would just drop oh, off yeah. and you know, it was stuff that I couldn't fix like automatically. Cause I did everything I could to make it automatic, but just being able to reach out and say, yeah, you know, Lisa and I were talking like just messaging real quick. And I was like, Oh, 
you know, just being just that one little lifeline, you know, kept my brain from exploding. You know, it's like I think, I think I had mentioned that I was triggered because I had a, a yeah. exact <laughs> same incident that gave me migraines for a week because I was trying to fix it and I was doing the same thing like breaking sentences into like, you know, triple space paragraphs and then you know, trying to put it back and every time I did the screen would jump and so I was like having seizures and mm-hmm. migraine. It was yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I remember that. Then yeah, you know what was what was crazy was <laughs> the, the other like, manuscript Help. the other manuscript from the the same author was was done in Word and it was formatted like I, I you know like he approached me after he had done the manuscript so he had already written the manuscript and all and it was just kind of like a last minute thing but the other one it took two hours you know which I, I felt like was a reasonable amount of time to switch it over from you know that to the format I wanted. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it had really nothing to do with him, uh, you know, with the other one. It was just the formatting, you know, from the right. technology, you know. But yep. being able to have that human connection with somebody who can relate to, you know, that that uh, that gopher hole that you tripped on in the backyard and twisted your ankle up on. You know what I mean? I think part of it, like, uh, when I was going through that, like, I was asking Danelle because I was like, hey – you know, you're editing and you know word pretty well. I think it's part of that is you want to know that you're not an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. What am I doing wrong? And why am I like fumbling why? like an idiot right now? And it's nice to hear that. No, this is a thing and you're okay. You'll figure it out. <laughs> so 90, 97 header sections. Yeah. And I was yeah. like, you know, cause yeah. you can attack like for, for those of you in the know, the header is like the little, you know, words at the top of the page or whatever. And there's the footer, usually uh, whatever you can do it, whatever you want. But I did the uh, alternating pages with the author's name and then the book title and mm. the numbers or whatever. Cause I, I kind of like that little thing or whatever, 97 sections. Mm. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> and I, I was like, I talk about, you know, feel like, you know, am I an idiot or not? I was going manually scrolling from chapter to chapter, just kind of looking through it. And then I was like, you know what? I'm going to put the headers at the end. I'm just going to do all, I'm going to do all this other stuff that I've got to do first, but I'm not going to, you know, worry about the header because it's taking away time for me trying to, you know, reformat these paragraphs and stuff. Right. So I'm sitting there doing the header at the end and right above it, there's like link to previous in Word. And then there's, Right above that is next, and right above that is previous. And I was like, mm-hmm. I wonder what this does. Click. Oh, no. And it jumped from, no, it was good. It was a good thing, Lisa. It jumped from <laughs> the, like, section 22 to section 23, and I was like, oh, what? When you find huh? something like that, and it's so obvious, you're like, wow. Yeah, I was like, huh? This this <laughs> is good. Forehead on the desk. Yeah, and, the like, it literally cut off, you know, Going a couple on. hours of work just by being yeah. able to do that. And, uh. And then the weird thing was because the way P- the Adobe did the formatting, it had, uh, it had well on the sections it had like this teeny tiny little, like it was like maybe, it, it had to be like maybe five point font or something like that. It was so small I couldn't even see it, and it was just like this one little section, and I was like, why well, won't this link to previous and just reformat itself? And I couldn't find, I couldn't find, I couldn't find, I couldn't figure it out. And I was like, man, what? Are, and I hit the control A and like this little <laughs> box popped up. And I was like, I was like, come on, dude. I was like, you're killing me. You're killing me here, Smalls. And then you know? uh, when I figured that out, uh, I was like, oh, okay. And then what I did was I ended up clicking on like uh, just the next one. I ended up just clicking on an outside space, not messing with anything else and just hitting link to previous. And it let me redo it. But the weird thing about Word, and this is like, you know, technology, and I love it, but the weird thing is, like, sometimes those functions, like, if you think you're doing everything the same, but Word's like, nah, buddy, it's not ready. It's not going to do that. Sorry. And there was, like, a page where it kept jumping back to a previous chapter, and I was like, what is this? I never did figure it out. I just got to work around on it. <laughs> so it was like. So Danell can tell you, like, Adobe has amazing features where you can, mm-hmm. like, do things that are super easy. It's like, oh, you click this button and it does everything great for you. But when you try to go to a different format, it's linking. It's like all this stuff in there. So it'll link this to that and this there and that there. So when you get it in your regular, like, Word or, you know, you're just trying to convert it back to, you know, whatever. Normal. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
it's um it's mm, interesting yeah I, there's <laughs> words that i can't say right now to adobe <laughs> that's right that's right well speaking of that we will take a we'll take a cool down break and do the station id stuff and we'll be back in two okay. minutes and we're gonna talk i want i want y'all to kind of give me a um a Genesis story of uh, the House of Stitch when we come back. Oh, yay. Oh. Yay. <laughs> the programming is provided by listeners and by Brighter Day Natural Foods. Brighter Day Natural Foods has been serving Savannah's healthy food and supplement needs since 1978. It is located at the corner of Bull Street and Park Avenue. They have available online ordering and curbside delivery, and now a walk-up window for smoothies, juices, and sandwiches from the deli. They are open from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday through Saturday, and 12 to 5.30 p.m. on Sunday. More information can be found at brighterdayfoods.com. All right, so we are back. I did the the donation. earlier i'm just going to throw this out there to y'all again uh, from me to you this is i love doing this radio show this is one of the reasons like throughout the pandemic i continued to do the show but i did more of a format like this where we have uh, calls and um, you know for safety for my guests and for myself and my family uh the station and all that but we cannot do any of this without our listener support, without our audience, you, the listener who are listening to this now or on the podcast at your convenience, this show doesn't happen without that. I don't get paid to do this show. I'm a volunteer. And even if they did, even if they offer say, Hey, I'd like to pay you. I'd say, Oh, well, you know, uh, yeah. Okay. You can pay me. <laughs> no, <I'm> just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, we're all volunteers. And, uh, but the station, you know, we have, we have utility bills. We have equipment um, that we have to maintain. We have a lease for our studio. Uh, there's a lo- there are a lot of expenditures that go into running a radio station outside of labor costs because we have volunteer time, you know. So go on to WRUU. Check it out. If you're so inclined, you can hit the donate button up there. You can donate a dollar. You can set up a you know a monthly donation, a one time donation. You know, if you like the programming for my show or any of the other shows that we have, because we have 65 different hosts, uh, all with different shows, we have, you know, a huge variety of programming here, all commercial free. I get to do stuff like this, like, you know, where I get to interview people like Lisa and Donnell talking about their magazine you know, I get to talk to authors, I get to talk to actors and filmmakers and musicians and, you know, I, I couldn't do that without y'all. So thank you, you know, as the listener, thank you as the audience, you know, for your support. Uh, thank you for your donations. And uh, you know, thanks a lot for just helping make this show just a, uh, a lot of fun to do. And, you know, I really, I, honestly, I, I love getting the feedback from uh, from the audience, from y'all. And uh, I love hearing from you, and so thanks a lot. And that's that's my little afternoon um, pitch. I'm gonna. I just I just feel like I wanted to share that with people because I don't think that like sometimes people. And this is one of the things I want to kind of go into with uh, the House of Stitch with y'all. Um, sometimes people don't understand that the folks that are creating content or media or entertainment or whatever that it takes a lot of effort it takes a lot of work it takes you know like y'all have a patreon right so there mm-hmm. like, there are expenses that go into production of making a magazine you know paying paying for production paying for equipment or software or you know uh, you might you might do a contract with an artist or you know someone who writes for you or whatever you might there, there's a lot of different things that go on to that and i just want to share that with people that you know hey if you like it, you know, it's a free market. <laughs> Support yeah. it, you know. I think it's important to remember with COVID that a lot of people um, are working from home. And, right. you know, we as artists during COVID were there for people who were experiencing some really traumatic times. Right. And art is a way of healing. Um, whatever your art is, it's a way of healing and expressing and getting those emotions out without having a complete breakdown. And 
you know, uh, during the pandemic, a lot of artists found that, you know, hey, I could stay at home and I can get paid to do what I do and to give somebody a little bit of um, relief and to get grounded again. You know, um, we are in a whirlwind. And, you know, every day there's something new going on. Um, so having something art beautiful on your wall to look at or having something to read to help you escape for a little while, you're right. A lot of work goes into that. Um, and if we can stay home and give you more, the more work we put into it, the better results that you get. But, you know, if you're working a full time job and we're still managing to find the time to do this, um, you know, sometimes if you're not getting paid for it, you're volunteering like that has to take the back the back seat because you got to pay bills so mm -hmm. letting yeah. an artist do what they love to do and to give back to the community is number one but when you pay an artist you're also building your community as well because though you know we're buying materials from the community we're buying you know uh, paper and you know art supplies and mm -hmm. you know buying in our community so it does really help and a lot of times we just forget because we have Amazon, right? Mm -hmm. We have Amazon and every, Amazon just delivers everywhere. We don't understand what, you know, it means to uh, give back economically to the community. And we just forget, you know, it's life. Um, but I'm glad that you're, you're exposing that because. Well, that's one of the reasons why. It would be a very scary world. Yeah, that's, that's one of the reasons why I continued to do the radio show throughout the pandemic because it could, they, they told us, hey, if you don't feel comfortable, you know, you can just put your show on hold. But mm -hmm. I wanted to continue doing that as a way to connect with my audience and as a way to, right. you know, um, like, for example, with your magazine, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that was a way that I could support my fellow creators and mm -hmm. artists as a platform to say, hey, you know, this is a, a radio show. There's no cost, uh, you know, involved with it. I mean, there's never any cost. Right. Uh, but, you know, some some places they charge for that kind of stuff. Right. And True. so, you know, for us indies, you know, it's like zero dollar budget. <laughs> you know, you put elbow grease and yeah. work in. And I, I thought it was a good way to be able to do that, connect with the with the folks and, and be able to continue to share it. And and I, I'm saying this because, like, I am one of those people that I work full time and I do, you know, I do my other stuff. You know, I, I've got a, a job where, I, you know, have to work, uh, pay the bills and all that's got to come first, you know, mm -hmm. and I feel like when as consumers like for example today i bought a comic book right and i also enjoy reading certain comics but i also like to try to support indie creators and uh you know it's it's weird because sometimes you'll never ever meet the folks that you love to read or the people that you watch you know movies or shows or whatever but when you connect with an indie, you know, and you like their work, you have a you have a way that, you know, I'm not saying that you should ever try to be, you know, French on somebody's personal life, but you have a way that you can connect with them directly most of the time because they're they're like, Hey, this is, you know, where my page is or this is where my books are or whatever. You can get an autographed copy of, you know, whatever. You know? Right. right. Here we are talking about your magazine, talking about my show, and 30 years ago, it wouldn't have happened, you know? Mm -hmm. Yep, definitely. That's true. I mean, it, it is the way it is. I, I have to admit, my eyes were totally open to the indie world because I just never realized that that was possible. And I don't think a lot of people realize that that is possible for a, a smaller, I don't want to say small time, but, you know, independent, somebody who just for whatever reason lightning didn't strike and they're not out there getting hounded by fans, but they have their own group. And I'm noticing that a lot of these independent authors and creators, all the creatives, they, they have their own fan group. They have people who follow them on social media and they have people who appreciate the work that they do. And I wanted to be a part of that. I mean, yeah, I want, I want to be big enough where my husband can retire and we don't have to worry about what we're going to live on when we're older at all. And, you know, just pocket his retirement for whatever, spend it on the grandkids. But I don't want to be so big that I have no privacy. And I think Indies have the best of both worlds. You have, you have a sense of privacy. You have your own private life, 
but then you have your fan base that loves your work and is willing to go to these conventions or anywhere they can just to say hi Mm -hmm. and treat you like a real person, not a bug in a jar with a magnifying glass. I agree with you completely on that. And, you know, one of the things that I love and, and the reason, I mean, I'm a published journalist for a major metropolitan newspaper. Right. And I've mm-hmm. seen other journalists, other reporters. I'm not a reporter, but um, I've seen other journalists uh, that they'll do like a book deal. And I mean, mm-hmm. there have been people here in my town that recently that have done this. They'll get a book deal with like a major publisher or whatever. And, you know, and then they go do like this pre COVID, but they would go do a book tour and yada, yada, yada. And, and, you know, and I'm not knocking anybody, okay? But a couple of people that I met, they thought that they had arrived. And, mm-hmm. you know, like that that fantasy of, like, you know, oh, I'm going to be a published author. I'm going to be rich and famous. And, you know, and the reality actually was uh, one of the people, and, you know, this person didn't act this way, but one of the people, you know, we were talking about their, their book deal from a major publishing house. No names mentioned, okay? I don't want to, right. you know, I don't want to, you know, infringe on anybody's privacy at all. But it was a major publishing house. They, you know, they had the book. They had the, you know, hardcover, dust jacket, beautiful rendition book, completely just wonderfully published. Beautiful. Beautiful. Zero upfront money. Zero marketing money. Zero advertising money. Zero. Zero. You know, and that is something that's more common than not. And I think, I think people don't understand, like, you know, and, and this, it makes sense, you know, because the publishers are putting up the front money for book production, but at the same time, it's, it's one of those things like, Hey, I'll let you r- drive this car and you know, you can use it, but it's, it's mine, you know? Um, and there's no gas, there's no gas, <laughs> oh, yeah, by the way, there's, there's no, no tires and you're going to yeah. have to put your own engine in. You no, know. there's tires. There's just no air in the tires. Yeah, no air really in the tires. Flat. Yeah, that might be even worse. Like, yeah. Uh, so you know that that was one of the things that for me, I, I did not have an appeal or any kind of inclination to want to query larger publishing houses for any of my work, and I didn't because I've seen the success of independent publishers. I've seen the success of uh, indie authors. I've seen the success of hybrid. I've seen the comic book industry change and morph from a, you know, the big players controlling all of the IP to independent creators saying, hey, you know, I created this, you know, Gort the Gondort character and you're going to pay me. (laughs) Uh, So for me, it was a fact of, you know, like you were talking about that connection, that community it was a fact of wanting to have control over my own work, starting a publishing house, a small publishing house and being able to work with the people that I want to work with, being able to connect with people and hear their stories. I mean, like right now I'm talking a little bit more than I I normally would, but I just feel like, you know, like this is so important to, to talk about because this world we live in today, you you don't have to go through traditional uh, publishing of media anymore. Well, I want to, I want to first a little, a couple bubbles with the, the difference between uh, small press independent, you know, if you're an independent author or if you're going to uh, a big publisher, because I think um, we had talked about this last week or last time we talked about how, you know, it used to be cool that you knew somebody who was underground and, you know, like bands get a right. huge right. bump if you're underground. It's super cool. Same with, you know, comics, but with authors, it's a little bit different. Well, here's the the bubble that I'm going to burst for you. Um, if you are an independent or you're in a small press, you have a lot more control over what happens with your work. So when you spend, you know, a year, 10 years, two years writing a book, you have this vision of what your child is going to look like when it's, when it's ready to be born. Right. And you have a vision for it. Like, this is my story. This is my vision. And you, you know, you put all your hopes and dreams into this work. And when you go into an independent press, a lot of times you have a lot more say, 
like, hey, I want my cover to look like this. Um, I really like this artist. Um, they're willing to, you know, cut us a break on the cover or you have, uh, you know, a local artist that can do the work for you. And, you know, what the end result is a lot more of your expectation than if you go to a big publisher. Now, the big publishers, you say, oh, well, you know, their editing is better and this and that. Well, here's the first bubble. They're outsourcing. So the, the editing isn't as pristine as it used to be. That's number one. Nope. Number two, you have no say. So when you take it to the editor and they don't like what you have in there, they're going to like, you're, they're bleeding all over the page, not for developmental, not to help you, but they're bleeding all over because it doesn't fit the agenda of what they're trying to push. So when you say, oh, like, you know, zombies are so popular right now and, oh, you know, vampires are popular and that's coming back again. It's the same thing like fashion. The publishers are going to say, um, we want to we want to bring this out now. We're going to be paranormal. Or Let me interject wanna, you know, something on, on that, vampires. too. Let me interject mm -hmm. something on that, too. Last week, my my guest uh, was on and she was talking about the publisher. She had a, a book deal, but, you know, they were working together for four or five months on the editing. And the publisher came back and said, this character, uh, we would instead of it being a brother, we would much rather it be a sister, which would have changed exactly. the entire right. story. Right, right, right. Exactly. And that's what I was saying. Like, you don't have any control. Once they cut something, it's a done deal or they just give you back your manuscript. Like, they're like, well, sorry, you know, that's it. You signed the contract. So this is going to change or here you go. Here, just take it and leave. And so when they tell you you're with the with the 800 pound gorilla in the room, like, hey, you know, if you don't do it the way we want it, you can leave. There's the door. Right. Just like I said, they're going to give you back your manuscript and be like, sorry, take it or leave it. And then the other thing is that. You know, when um, they give you that advance, so you're like, oh, well, indies don't give you an advance. I really want that fat check for $20,000. That's against your sales. So if you don't sell, number one, you're not going to work with them again. And number two, like I'm, I, last I heard, and I'm not 100% on it, but from some people I've heard, like they are pushing to get that money back somehow. So that means you've got to do whatever they want you to do for, you know, uh, book tours, um, they, they, own you. They, they, they basically own you. They know your time. It doesn't matter what's going on. Um, you got to fly the way that they want you to fly. If you don't like flying, screw you. You got to fly. You know, they, well, they don't also, really care. You're under you contract are... and you're not allowed to publish outside of that as well. Like, you know, if you're under contract right. and I mean, right. and, and some of the contracts are, and I'm not knocking traditional publishing anybody. Okay. I'm just saying, no. uh, some of the contracts, they will say that they own, the IP or they own all the mm -hmm. merchandising rights or, right, right. you know, like future merchandising rights and into perpetuity Possible and film rights. Yeah. And you right. know, so sometimes movies and that's where your money comes from. And then when you have a movie, like for example, you know, you have uh, the original, you know, uh, vampire chronicles, you know, like, Hey, it didn't matter who she wanted at first because she didn't have the rights in her contract to say, I get to, you know, she just thought, Hey, they read the book. They know what it's supposed to be, but you know, queen of the damn great movie. If it's a vampire movie, but not Lestat. Right. So you're nope. expecting big fans are like, where's my golden haired Lestat. And then there's this gothy black haired dude on there. I was like, what just happened? You know? So my point is not to bash anything. My point is to lift the veil of what yes. publishing is and that, you know, when you're bashing on these authors, they're like, oh, you're just an indie or you don't, you're not really made it. You, so what, you're a published author. The real, the real um, challenge that they accomplished is that they wrote a book yeah. and they wrote it and that the public has received it. And whether or not it's your cup of tea, like it's really hard to write a book, go through any sort of editing, good or bad. It's really hard to do it. You know, I had Jonathan Mayberry on. Story. And he was talking about that same thing that like less than 1% of all people who say they want to write a book actually finish the book. And even right. a smaller percentage of those people actually publish. So, you know, if you in any form, if you put, put a book out there and I'm not talking about like just, hey, you just slop something together and you just threw it out there like, oh, I can make a lot of money. I'm talking about like you actually legitimately crafted a book, published it and said, hey, world, it, it might it might be, you know, just a plain green cover with white writing saying, you know, the Lord of the Rings uh, or whatever, you know, it might just be a plain cover, but it, it could be, you know, the next Lord of the Rings gem that's out there. Right. So I just think that people should open up their mind just a little bit and say, you know, um, give it a chance yeah. because 
a lot of people nowadays are discovering that they like the indies much better than the, you know, traditionally published because there is that freedom to break some rules. And sometimes it's done really cleverly. So, well, like you were saying, Danelle, too, I, I like uh, that community. You know, I like oh, yeah. that uh, where, you, you know, when you like something, like you're talking about Shaun of the Dead horror mm-hmm. comedy, I am a huge fan of Shaun of the Dead. Um, I love that movie. Yeah. And, Simon Pegg and Nick Frost are a couple of my favorite actors. And, you know, when you when you have something that you dig like that and you're like, oh, man, you know, you like Shaun of the Dead? Oh, yeah, I like Shaun of the Dead. Yeah. Did you know? Blah, 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 blah. And, you know, you can go on and on and on. And mm-hmm. the Internet has changed the way that we communicate. You know what I mean? So we can meet people from across the world, you know, and oh, be yeah. able to communicate in real time. It's it's just it's fascinating. I mean, before I met Lisa, I never even considered that I would possibly ever be able to talk to somebody like Laurel K. Hamilton or Jonathan Mayberry or Josh Mallerman or Jonathan Jans or anybody for that matter. It's I lived in my own little bubble and I had I was one of those that had a dream of someday I want to write a book. And no, I have not written it, but it is in process and. Um, I started out in journalism and I switched over to the fiction, to fiction editing. And now I'm combining the two, my two loves, my love of not, you know, being able to share information and my love of being able to create. And I have now meshed them together thanks to people like Lisa and the opportunity that House of Stitch magazine has given me because I do a little bit of poetry and I, and I write a little bit of some short stories, but then I also am able to use my journalistic degree. I can, I can put it back to use because I got out of that. And then I'm, I'm able to, like I said, meld it together and I can meet people and I can talk to people and I can do things like your show. And it's just, it's a wow moment. And I I'm sitting here with my tablet in my lap doing paint by number app as I listen and, and contribute just so I'm not bouncing around making a bunch of noise because I'm excited. I feel giddy because I'm like, to me, no, I'm not out there signing autographs or anything, but to me, I've made it. I'm living my dream. That's Finally, wonderful. At 53 years old. Yeah, that's wonderful. I'm doing what I've, what I want to do by taking two worlds and meshing them together and doing it with some, one, some of the greatest people that I've met in this industry and with somebody who is so supportive and driven as Lisa. You can't so ask for a better awesome. partner. She she she's driven too. She just needs a kick in the butt every once in a while to let her know that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Speaking, so speaking of driving the show her. on, uh, let's we gotta wrap this hour up, believe it or not. What is the best place that people can check out the House of Stitch magazine? Um, so we have houseofstitch.com, we have House of Stitched on Facebook, we have House of Stitched on uh, Twitter, and of course TikTok. now we have TikTok. <laughs> and people and can TikTok. also pick up the magazine. I, I picked my copy up on Amazon, but if they want to check it out, they can go to Amazon, right? Uh, no, so the magazine on digital is on Amazon. If they want the physical copy, um, all the links, everything you need for it is on com. Okay, okay, great, great, great. All right, so we're going to be back the next hour. And uh, and I agree with you, Donnell. I think Lisa uh, is a very uh, nice person. We just we literally just met a couple of weeks ago, uh, talking or whatever. But um, I'm really impressed with both of y'all and what you've been doing with the magazine. And I know that feeling, Donnell, when you know. Uh, and I've got the next hour. I want to tell you about how I got into journalism because I I think you will uh, you be able to appreciate it more than any uh, most other people <laughs> because uh, the background. But everybody, you tune in today. Okay. Um, this has the, been the Adam Messer show here with Lisa Vasquez and Donnell Party Whiting. Is that my... Got it in one. Okay, okay, good. Go star. <laughs> I get, I get, um, I get tumbled up on those uh, those uh, dual names sometimes. So, um, but yeah, everybody, tune in. If you missed this first hour, don't worry about it. You can go to youtubecom slash Messer, uh, pick it up there, or you can go to the Adam Messer Show the previous episode with Lisa is already up there, so you can listen to that if you want to. And then uh, on all your favorite uh, apps, just check out the Adam Messer show. You can pick it up on any of your apps that you like to listen to the podcast on. <laughs>